Hello and welcome to The Exchange. Several times a day, we can be faced with varying degrees of conflict, frustration or anger. Whether at home, in the workplace or even driving our car, wherever there are people, there is potential for conflict. Conflict in most cases is unpleasant, so how can we stand up for what we believe in but keep our relationships intact at the same time? Conflict is a part of life. It happens because people encounter all different types of ideas and opinions. It can happen between people we don't know, and it can also happen between people we do know. Regardless of who, where, when and why, conflict is a part of our human nature and is never pleasant. But is there a way of keeping relationships intact? To discuss the issue, we have Fred Stern, who is a senior mediator, consultant at Conflict Solvers. Fred has a wealth of experience in conflict resolution and training with business, families, teens and a wide array of individuals and community groups. Also, we have Meredith Fuller, who has over 30 years experience as a psychologist working in private practice and consulting for major organisation, an author, lecturer and spokesperson for the Australian Psychological Society. Great to have you both with us. Great. Fred, do you think that we are becoming more uh, intolerable as a society? Look, I think that there's a lot of pressures put on everyone and I think that's changed um, over the years. And, and it's not surprising then that, uh, that conflict perhaps is uh, at a greater level than it perhaps used to be. I mean, especially with things like, you know, social media being around and the pressures on people to, uh, you know, I guess earn a good income and stuff like that. So uh, it's not surprising. Yeah, so you'd say it is on the rise? I think it will be on the rise, yes. Right. Meredith, I'm interested to know why some relationships, they start off so beautifully, all lovey-dovey and all of that kind of thing, and then just kind of descend into this uh, massive uh, arguments and conflict, etc. Give us some reasons for that. We often select a partner who's the opposite of ourselves or reminds us of our mother or father or a senior caregiver in our lives. What attracted us was the difference. As soon as we're with them, we want to make them like us. Yeah. So bizarre? you argue about the very thing that brought you together in the first place, which was difference. Yeah, that's a very good point, isn't it? I think, you know, we certainly opposites and uh, we, when we got together, there were some interesting arguments and things like that. But then I think after a while... Very minor ones, you oh, know, like where you squeeze minor. the toothpaste and who really cares about where you squeeze the or toothpaste. Or hang the toilet roll. So or hang the toilet like roll. But it's interesting, like after the period of time, you actually start to appreciate the differences again, or at least that's what we've we found in our own experience. Yeah, or find that the, the difference is, you know, it's that whole thing of not making people conform to being who you are. So what are some of the things, the different styles of problem solving that we can look at in relationships, Fred? I think that the perhaps one of the most important things is to be able to almost lay some ground rules around how you might interact with each other. And in those ground rules, I think the most important is that we need to listen. I think most people tend to base on what they're seeing with perception. You know, we often have these perceptions around, well, I think you're doing this. Remember that words actually don't account for much in terms of how people may uh, listen to what you say. It's often about the body language and about the tone in your voice. Yeah, mm. that's true. Different personalities, different situations, they call for different measures of conflict resolution, different styles. I think with different personalities, I, th I think the main thing is a bit of patience, to be honest. I just think people tend to often put their own perceptions around what they're hearing and that's probably the biggest problem. Once, once we go down that path then most of the conflicts that I deal with people end up uh, believing that the story or what they're hearing and what, what people are saying um, is basically something that you know isn't pleasant in their view or are words they don't want to hear etc. Mm. So. Meredith would you say that are there some um, personality constructs that are just they they just want conflict they almost thrive on it and if they're not giving it to people or people are not giving it back uh, they're not alive absolutely so if I'm if I'm excited about having conflict I'm not <laughs> going to be interested in someone who wants to appease me or look for a win-win because I actually think I'm having a 
hearty debate and I need that adrenaline going to keep me activated, otherwise I lose energy. So is it so, better to ignore yeah. someone like that? Not give them, not feed the energy? I think the most important thing we need to remember is we need to come back to good manners. Okay. And part of good manners is we often treat people we know very poorly. So basic good manners and also the more we know ourselves, we know our own triggers and we might work out strategies for working with someone who's very different. The person who's more self-aware is going to be more concerned about how will I get the best out of the other person I might need to do this or that or the other and that's why good leaders, good heads of households understand and appreciate difference so that they're not going to take things personally but they will understand one size doesn't fit all. You do need different strategies according to who you're engaged with. Fred, the, the way we deal with conflict in our personal lives, does that determine how we deal with conflict at work? Look, a lot of conflict often, particularly once we get into the workplace, is our own based values. Um, and often the values that, that we might have grown up with or we might have learned, often in a workplace situation, if something goes wrong, we often fall back to those values. I think the other thing that's important to say, though, is with conflict that, you know, I'm comfortable with it, and that's mainly because, to me, conflict is nothing more than you want something to change, and that's what people need to remember. Yeah. You just simply want whatever's happening to change. You may not necessarily have the language for it. And what if that change is actually not possible, uh, either in the workplace, the change that the person is asking for is not possible in the workplace or in a marriage? I think if the changes aren't possible, at least what still comes out of a conversation is an ability to hear clearly what the other person wants. That's, mm -hmm. still, that's, still, that's still a good thing. Mm -hmm. If you actually hear what, it, what the other person wants, and I think it's important to understand that we can't expect people to immediately change upon this discussion. People need to reflect on it. They might need to go away and think about what's being said. I've got to say, and, and, and I'm trying to be nice to men here, but we don't generally like to change straight away. We like to kind of go away and think about things and perhaps, you know, perhaps do those actions that are useful uh, perhaps later on. <laughs> right, OK. Well, that's a good, I'm glad you said that because yeah. I agree with you and, and, and it's understanding yourself and, and understanding mm. others. Yeah. Meredith, you, you wrote a book, uh, Working With Mean Girls. I'm glad it was a woman that uh, wrote that book yeah. and not a man. <laughs> uh, what inspired you to, to write that book? In my practice, I noticed that a lot of women were having terrible difficulty in the workplace with other women who were not listening and causing so much stress that they were having problems getting out of bed to go to work. And because women feel that they should be able to resolve interpersonal issues, they weren't talking about it, so it was becoming this hidden secret. So I wanted to enable people to be able to talk about how they feel and then work out some strategies so that they can self-manage and manage other people that are causing this distress rather than thinking, oh, there's something wrong with me because I'm so affected by someone else. Right. So working with Mean Girls, you've written another book as well. Is that, is that the companion to the first one? Working with Bitches, yes. yes. So Great title. <laughs> <laughs> which, which was first? Which was the first book? Mean Girls. Oh, so it actually got stronger. It this did is get the stronger, stronger unedited edition. Absolutely. Right. So it can be Mean Girls 2 or something like that. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm intrigued to know as well why we often uh, run into difficulties with the people who are nearest and dearest to us. We can end up having some of the greatest conflict with the people who are close. Why would that be? I think, uh, and particularly in uh, family law mediation that I do, uh, the one thing that comes across very clearly is we learn very quickly what buttons to push on the other person. We quickly learn um, what, uh, you know, what we might say that might upset the other person or what actions we may do, etc. And that's something that once people have learnt that, if they're in conflict, they may then decide, this is the way I want to hurt you. Do we also let our guard down? I'm, I'm taking it out of the family law court now, just into your average normal family. Um, you know, we're kind of on our best behaviour through the day, maybe at work and in different relationships. Is it we just let our guard down when we get home and become the real us? 
Yeah, look, I, I tend to feel that. I, you know, we do wear masks, and I think that's an important point, that when people are in, in the public's eye, uh, they do tend to, I guess, put on a mask, or a professional mask, I kind of like to call it. But, of course, within our own home, we like to think that, look, our partner or whoever else is in the family home actually knows us and they're a, and we can let that guard down. Is it possible that, that in the family home you, you know, you've had demands on you all day at work and then you have demands on you when you get home, especially for a woman um, in relation to you know, kids asking you. I was away with uh, girlfriends and they said, what was the best part of the weekend? I said, I had a shower with nobody asking me about what to wear <laughs> yeah. or what clothes. Um, and, and that's just me. You know, it <laughs> seems the like... Kids. It seems like, yes, it seems like <laughs> such a small thing, uh, but it's the, it's the thing that makes your tolerance level because of, of pressure, which we, we alluded to earlier. This is a wonderful discussion. We're going to keep it going with Street Talk and a whole lot more right after this break. Don't forget, if you want to know more, head over to our website and we'll be back with more in just a moment. What do you do when conflict arises in a relationship? I don't know, I'm pretty bad with that one. Um, I think it's important to step back a little bit and give each other some space. Um, I find that reading a lot helps me. Uh, Communication is key at the end of the day, so if you can chat it out regardless if it uh, you know, starts off really abrupt at the start, as long as you come to a solid resolution at the end of it, yeah. you'll be fine. I've been single for 10 years, so that's, that's solved everything. Badly. <laughs> I'm probably the one that starts the conflict, so he offers hugs. So, <laughs> hug it out. I think there's a tendency for people not to back off anymore. I think this is promoted by society, personally. Uh, and I think it comes from the very top in politics, that everyone's in conflict, but no one seems to be interested terribly much in compromise and understanding. Well, I guess, first of all, I try and decide whether it's actually worth fighting for, the actual issue. Um, I always had a friend who told me that, you know, you need to evaluate that first, and certainly with kids, we have this with the kids all the time, is work out whether it's actually important or not important. And if a messy room really doesn't change the world, then basically we just try and ignore it and try and keep the issues to what is actually genuinely a serious issue. And what do you do to try and maintain the peace? Uh, uh, usually comedy. I, I just laugh it off. You have to have laughter. If you're not with someone that doesn't make you laugh, then it's not really worth it, is it? Especially if children are involved, because if there's conflict between the parents, the children interpret that as acceptable behaviour. I have to say that I'm actually not a great peacekeeper in my house. I actually say I'm... Um, I'm actually probably overreactive if anything to start with and then it takes me a bit of time to calm down and actually think, okay, I really overreacted to that and yeah, so I'm not the great peacekeeper I'm afraid in our relationship. So my husband is much better at that. He's very relaxed and calm and just says, oh well, look, it really doesn't matter. What do you do when conflict arises in a relationship? Eat lots of donuts. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you do then to try to keep the peace? Keep your mouth shut's the best way to keep the peace with a woman, I think. Yeah. <laughs> So she's always right? Yeah, the women's always right. Good man. OK, thank you. Oh, I love that. Welcome back and welcome to Sandra, our Street Talk reporter. Some Hi. really good responses there. Yes, the woman's always right. That's, <laughs> that was the last response. Apparently, yeah. <laughs> and eat donuts. That clearly seems donuts. to help. <laughs> well, probably not. But what, what did you guys pick out of that, Fred? I think what I, uh, what I liked, and I heard a few people talk, especially around communication, the space bit's important, and someone did mention that about giving people space, but that has to make sure that that doesn't lead to the most typical um, side of conflict, which is avoidance behaviour. Mm -hmm. So often people think that if we avoid each other, well, that's going to solve the problem. But of course, mm -hmm. without talking about the problem, it just becomes greater in each person's mind. Mm -hmm. So um, what's healthy space in your mind and avoidance? When does it, when does it tip over? I think healthy space is when um, you feel ready to talk about the issue without feeling angry about it or without feeling that, you know, you've got to have a go at the other person. And what if they want to talk about it earlier? You just say, I just need some space? Absolutely, absolutely. Yep. That's fine. You know, just say, look, I'm absolutely prepared to talk about it. 
I just need that, you know, I just need a little bit of space before we sit down and talk about mm -hmm. the issue. And Meredith, someone actually said that, um, you know, we don't like to back down anymore. We've lost almost the art of compromise. Would, would you agree with that? Is, are people just needing to always be right? One of the things we've lost is the notion of feeling safe. If we don't feel safe, we feel as though it's a life and death situation. When we do feel safe, we can agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. And then we can explore what's the feeling underneath that conflict that you won't back down. So it's really important to understand why are we angry? Often we're angry because we're hurt. Mm -hmm. If we're not prepared to look underneath the presenting emotion, we're never going to resolve it. So you go around in circles like a groove and you're stuck. What I really liked that um, I heard there too was that notion of humour. If yes. you can use humour, um, you can actually enable people to free up enough to become creative about how they could move on. And so it is important that if you suppress one emotion, you suppress all of your emotions. We need to learn that it's acceptable to be angry. We just need to do anger well. Yep. But if you're, humor, if you're being funny or humorous, is there the potential for someone going, oh, you're not taking me seriously, you're not taking what I'm saying, um, you know, to, to face making value? Light of yeah, it. making light yeah. of it. Yeah. So, Sandra, you've raised a really important point. It's knowing when, when. to mm. respond mm. with what kind of reaction. And I think the most important thing is we always need to ask ourselves, what has been triggered in me by this exchange? Mm. And never to say, you always do this, or you make mm. me do that, mm. and take self-responsibility. Yeah. How can I make reparation? What is it specifically that mm. you're most angry about? What would you like me to do differently? And if, if you're able to understand you can take responsibility for your own feeling, and even that responsibility for saying, I'm feeling flooded at the moment, I'd like to take a minute, mm. I'd like to come back and then come Again, back. That's, that's yeah. good communication, that's fine. isn't it? Mm. Yeah. What about agreeing to disagree, Fred? Look, I think there's I think that's healthy. It's nothing wrong with agreeing to disagree. Because at the end of the day, if you've got to that stage of a conflict, you're also pretty aware of what needs to change. Mm. And that's what I like about it when you get to that yeah, you know, when you get to agreeing not to uh, to disagree. It's like the lady said uh, on Street Talk as well, it's um, learning how to pick your battles. Absolutely. What are the ones worth fighting and what are the ones we just let go? Mm. Absolutely. And maybe why they mean that to you. Like she mentioned a messy room, but that in your life could actually mean more to you. It could mean order, it could mean mm. uh, responsibility, it could mean taking pride in what you have, looking after what you have when yeah. so much of the world doesn't. So it has a bigger meaning mm. to you than yeah. to the situation. I like the one, the lady who said be single. She's been single <laughs> for a long time. Yeah, but she's still, a, she's still an employee, presumably, yes. and she's still a friend, presumably, yeah. a daughter, so you still can't avoid conflict. Exactly. In a relationship, the most critical issue seems to be, do you put the bath mat back after the bath? <laughs> who cleans the toilet? If someone feels that they can't relax until everything's tidy, and the other person doesn't bother doing anything until there's total chaos. If you're able to say, this affects me in this way, I understand it doesn't affect you, it's really important to me, let's find a way through. Sometimes that might be, we'll both put in and pay someone else to do it. Yeah. You can find a way forward. Or if you appreciate why the other person's upset, you might say, I don't care about the bath mat, but I care about you. So I'm going to add that step, and in return, I want you to add this step for me. So. It, in, it allows you to engage more in a way through that's more creative mm. rather than thinking it's a battle and one of us has to win. win. So there's good mm. compromise there then, isn't there? And so, I mean, you're like that. You can't relax until the, the lounge has to be neat and tidy, the carpet has to be yeah. vacuumed. If Christy's out, I'm happy just to lie down on the couch and watch TV. I'm I don't Christy. care what's on the carpet, but I know that it's important for Christy. I, so I will let you know that other areas can be fine. It's just I need one area that is yeah. relaxing. Totally, and I get that. So <laughs> it works. Yep. Wonderful. Sandra, thanks for popping thanks. in. Thanks. Don't forget you can see more of Sandra and Street Talk by heading over to the exchange, tv.com.au. We'll be back with more right after this.
Welcome back. We're discussing conflict resolution and whether we can agree to disagree with Fred Stern and Meredith Fuller. I'd like to uh, ask you both actually the question of uh, when is it necessary to go for professional help? When should people go and try and sort out a major conflict? I think with, uh, particularly with conflict resolution, which is the area I do work in, I think when it gets to the stage where people can no longer listen to each other, where people are, I guess, fairly angry with each other all the time and feel that that there isn't any way of re reaching a resolution. And, and that's often when they will call on a, a third party such as a mediator. I think it's important to understand that when you are searching for someone to go to, you don't contaminate it by, well, look, I want to go to my therapist and bring you because you need adjustment, so I'll take you. <laughs> it's very important that you look for someone who's neutral and you're both comfortable with. And it's like getting your hair cut. You have to look around and get someone that's suitable. And I know, you that's need... a problem all the time. Yeah. <laughs> you need to know that that person knows what they're doing. They have basic common sense as well as the capacity to see you so you're not invisible. And they're not too quick to use judgement or put labels on things, but they are very interested in exploring because usually these are very complex issues and simplistic answers really don't help you. Yeah, well, and it's very important that you understand that it's a process and processes take time. So quick fixes, not gonna work. Mm. Yeah. I mean, being around people for 30 years as I have been, I know I look young, but, um, but I've found that there's been trends in eating, there's been trends in different things and there seems to be psychological trends and at the moment everybody's talking about PTSD or everybody's talking about narcissism where do we where do we be careful with with that Meredith what do we need to watch what out labeling? for yes yeah really important to have some self-responsibility and self-reliance if we use labels as excuses we stop growing the minute we stop growing what is the point so we can try to understand ourselves because the more self-aware we are, the better the quality of our own lives. And also in terms of role modelling for families, if your children and your families see that you are interested and curious about yourself and obtaining feedback, they can then tolerate doing that themselves and you can have a more healthy dialogue. Mm. Fred, is there a time to just simply realise that a friendship or a relationship is over unsalvageable and you just simply give up on it? I think for most people that time comes after trying and look if people try I think there's a reality it's like sometimes we may no longer be friends with someone um, you know we all need something from someone else whether that's a friendship whether that's a relationship and if we're not experiencing what we need yeah, we may give up on it. I mean, just also I wanted to make a quick comment on uh, what Meredith said. Uh, it's interesting with labels. I think Google has a lot to answer for, let me tell you. In yes. what way? <laughs> In everybody likes to look up and uh, then diagnose somebody, somebody else. Somebody else. Yeah. Yes. Whereas maybe we should be diagnosing ourselves and working uh, uh, maybe ourselves not. out. Maybe we should be going to professional Absolutely. for that. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. What about when you go to a professional? I've, I've seen this a number of times with couples that we've tried to help, is that they will go to a counsellor and one of them will then say, I always feel like he or she is biased against me and favouring the other person. Is that unprofessional? One of the things we need to be aware of is often unconsciously we'll pick a partner who reminds us of someone in our family of origin and one of us is probably going to pick a counsellor, a psychologist, a helper, a colleague, a friend, a mentor, a coach, um, who also reminds us of someone else. Okay. So it's very important to be able to ask yourself, who does this person remind me of? What's going on here with myself? And again, I come back to that notion of saying, we need to both feel that we're safe. The way we feel safe is that we both feel visible. If one of us is feeling invisible, it ain't working. No. Yeah. Great advice. We need to finish there. But thank you, Fred. Yeah. Thank you, Meredith, thank for you. your very helpful advice today. And thank you for joining us. Don't forget, we'd love to hear your thoughts and ideas on what's important to you and what you think we should be addressing on this program. Hope you can join us next time. Bye for now.